Hey girl, how are you today? Just waiting to see a couple people, more people want to get on. I don't want my hair sticking up like that. Wanted to come on and do a recap since we don't have the study on day six and seven. So we have a study on day one through five, and that is breaking down several scriptures at a time. At a time, really dissecting the scriptures. I'm sorry, you're exhausted. I'm feeling that way too. That's why I waited to get on today. I had a plan at eight o'clock to get on. And I just like couldn't do it. Um, and then I tried to go for a walk and came across a rattlesnake. <laughs> so that was fun. I was frustrated with that. So I didn't finish my walk, even though I wasn't really scared. I was just more aggravated. So the boys went looking after for it and they didn't find it. But um, anyways, sorry for the ums. I wanted to come on and really kind of give a recap of the week in the study of Acts. And one of the questions that I love in this study that Anne asks as we're learning to study the Bible scripture by scripture, verse by verse, the word by the word is, what will I do to live it out? In other words, how does this pertain to me if it does sometimes we just study the bible and it may not at that time it may later on there's a lot of different scenarios with that but we can certainly look at does the lord want me to do something different or is he reinforcing what he's already called me to is there an area that i really need to submit and surrender and give to him which that's always the case i think i think until we go home there's going to be that struggle of when to maybe let go and to grow and we get so comfortable in our ways and I think that's one of the things that this shutdown has done is kind of shown us how we are set in our ways and we do like things very comfortable and when that doesn't happen it can kind of shake our faith I know the last couple of days I was kidding someone and I said I feel like I have corona hangover and that is just the exhaustion from all of the news and dissecting truth and recognizing that really the best news, and I actually posted this a few days ago, is the good news of Jesus Christ and that he came and died for our sins and that he gives gives us eternal life in heaven. And so that really is the only trustworthy news that we have and that is something that we can stand firm on and sometimes you do have to just go back to that and say I don't know anything else Lord but I know that what you say is true and you are real and you are the Lord of my life so one of the things I wanted to go over these are just some points that are highlights that I recognize during the week that when I am when I'm weak and when I fail or stray, or I'm prideful, and I recognize that, and I have conviction that I can always run back to Jesus. He's always waiting. You know, I look at Judas, who was talked about in the scriptures in these verses, and Judas, he betrayed Jesus, a, an outright betrayal, and he did that for self-exaltation. He did it for uh, money purposes, which apparently it wasn't a tremendous amount of money, money that he betrayed him for. It could have been for power. Um, not really sure all of his motives. We can't assign motive, but he was a greedy person. He was someone that, excuse me just a minute, I need to wipe out a message here. He was someone that um, did steal apparently from the treasury, so he was money driven. Peter also was one that failed Jesus, and his was a, a failing in denying him, and that's, to me, self-preservation. And many times, you know, if you catch a, Stephanie, if you're still on here, if you catch a your child in a lie, 
the reason that he's lying and doesn't want to tell you the truth is because he doesn't want the repercussions of it. He doesn't want the punishment. He felt like what he did in the moment was worth any punishment, but when it comes down to it, he is going to try and self-preserve. And so that to me is what Peter did. The, the amazing thing to me is that if at any time Judas had decided to repent and turn back to the Lord, that the Lord would have forgiven him and he would have restored him into right relationship or brought him into right relationship is what I should say, because I think Judas never really was a disciple. I think he was just a deceiver from the beginning. And yeah, like, like almost burning your house down. Like when he, when you confronted Connor, when he did what he did, he denied it, of course, right? Because he did not want the consequences for that. But as his mom, while he had consequences, there was no denial that he got in trouble. You still love him. You didn't stop loving him. You can be aggravated with him and you don't like what he did and you don't like where he's at right now in the things that he's doing, the choices that he's making, but you still, you still love him. You're his mom. And our mom's did that for us, a lot of us, not not all of them, but you know, I know yours did. And loved you through a lot of things, through loved you through betrayal, loved you through denial, loved you through hurting her feelings, even when it wasn't on purpose. And I know that, you know, God is so much greater than that. And when we look at that, I think that's something that's a huge lesson for us. And that when we fail, when we falter, that we are still counted among the brethren, brethren, and that we can come back and wait for him to tell us what to do next. We come back, it says his kindness leads us to repentance. So I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for us to see kind of how that works and how the disciples, as they came into the upper room and as they waited for Jesus and did what he said to do, that they were brought back into right relationship because they actually all denied him. None of them stood with him or they would have been killed as well. They would have been crucified as well. And thankfully, Jesus stands well above us and is always there as our advocate, way more than we could ever advocate for advocate for him. The other thing I noticed was that Jesus uses both the educated Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, was was pretty educated. He was a doctor, and um, but he also used Peter. Peter Peter knew the law. Peter knew what it was to be a Jew, but and and he did at some point follow that. But he he was not a learned real learned man. But the Lord really used him in establishing. He calls him the rock of the church, and so a cornerstone. And so I think we need to look at. The fact that Jesus uses, God uses both the educated in spite of their education, because sometimes you can be so educated that you're, you're stupid, you're stupid in your choices because you think that you're smarter than God and that's dumb. So I think that we need to see that our, our limitations, the world limitations are not God's limitations, that Stephanie, he wants to use you. And yes, he's going to want to use Connor as well. And one of the things that you're learning through this parenting process is really a lot how Jesus feels and that we do this with him. The way that Connor reacts to you is many times the way that you re you've reacted to God and I've reacted to God. It's no different as parenting to me is one of the greatest ways to understand God. Now, sometimes that means we're an aunt and sometimes that means we're, you know, a foster parent or maybe we're a big brother, a big sister. But those type of situations where people hurt us or or betray us and we we still have a relationship with them, it doesn't break the relationship. It will hurt it for a while, and certainly. And we can do that with God. You know, the prodigal son, when he left, he he walked away from that relationship and it hurt the relationship, but the father was still his father and still waiting for him. So we need his spirit though. We need his guide. You know, when Jesus told the disciples to go back and wait for the filling of the Holy spirit, it's because we need the spirit. We need the comforter. We need that 
one who judges our heart, but loves us anyways. And so he knows the good, the bad and the ugly about us. And he loves us anyways. And that always to me is amazing because, you know, I've been, I've had a lot of hurt in my life and I don't always continue to love the people that have hurt me. Now I ha- I am called to forgive them. I'm called to love them in Christ, but I don't necessarily have to keep and continue uh, allowing the abuse and things like that it just depends on on what it is and how God is leading me. Our work is important no matter who sees it. Uh, Hannah brought that up in the study and it just really uh, struck struck with me too is that you know especially during this coronavirus nobody knows what we're doing at home nobody knows the work we do and when you're home with children especially you don't get a paycheck for that you don't get half the time you don't even get a thank you and so it can be kind of a thankless job but it's a huge important job so i think we need to look at not the importance by the world's view, but the importance of what God calls us to and being faithful in that. I know my husband asked me one day, he said, why do you, why do you find such joy in helping other people and like being kind of in the background a lot of times? Sometimes you're in the front. And he said, but Karen, I don't understand. Like it causes a lot of pain sometimes and hurt. And I said, you know, I, I that's just at the time I didn't know what to answer him. And then I went for a walk and the Lord just kind of spoke to me and I believe that he's called me to be an encourager. Now, does that mean I'm always encouraging? No. I mean, sometimes I'm the one tearing down. But for the most part, I love encouraging people to live their walk and to live what God has called them for. So I think that our our work needs to be seen as important no matter who else sees it. So that's one of the other things that I really saw in this study. So as we go on, I'll, I'll probably give an update either on day six or day seven when it's possible. As I said today, I did plan on coming on at eight and I just really physically, emotionally, mentally, it wasn't there. And I had to really kind of take care of myself. I did end up exercising. I didn't walk, but I just took my time today. I recognize that being a victim of domestic violence, having being a survivor, and I'm not just a survivor. I mean, I'm well beyond that. I'm victorious in Christ. But I do struggle sometimes with the effects of PTSD. And so when trauma hits, I can shut down and that exhaustion just takes over and I forget to take care of myself. And so sometimes we just have to do that and rest in the Lord and recognize that it's not about my being a human doing. It's about being a human being and being in his presence and being at his feet and being his daughter. When I was getting ready for a mission trip, I spoke with this in the in the beginning of the group that my name for this group, the heart of a woman, is because the Lord spoke to me that for so long and so many studies were talking about being that warrior. And I'm all about that. You know, I'm I'm kind of one that, you know, is a kind of a, you know, what I want to say, uh, uh, I want justice. I'm a just, very justice seeking person. But, you know, sometimes I just need to crawl up in my father's lap and have attention and be comforted. And so I need to take that time to rest and just be his daughter, to be his princess. So I, I think of more princess warrior than warrior princess. So that's just where I'm at right now and where God has led me to. The other thing is that he knows us and still loves us. He's never deceived by our words nor our actions. We can even deceive ourselves sometimes. There's times where I've looked back on something and I think, I really didn't have the right heart in that matter. And I didn't even necessarily see it or I fooled myself. And so he never is fooled nor deceived by us nor anyone else. You know, we we can think we have right motives and we look back or something happens and we think, wow, I really didn't. I I remember telling someone one time, "Uh, you have been really horrible to me and you've hurt me tremendously, but I'm always going to be there for you. And guess what? I I'm not, I'm not there for that person. They are no longer in my life. The hurt grew, grew to be too much for me. I'm not God. And so the Lord showed me that, I really was committed until the hurt just so, got so great. I couldn't, couldn't be that anymore. So he's never deceived by our words. 
did I mean that at the time? I thought I did, but the Lord showed me that it just wasn't where I was supposed to be. And the other thing that this study kind of brought to my attention was he will he will return the way that he left. And I'll be honest with you, there's some days where I'm homesick. I'm ready to go home with a capital H. I said that this morning, actually. I said, man, I am just ready to go home. That doesn't mean I'm suicidal. It doesn't mean I'm going to do anything, nothing like that. It's just that we have a longing as believers. This is not our home. We are aliens here. And so we have that homesick feeling sometimes of, you know, I just want to be with my Lord full time and in heaven without all the pain, without all the suffering, without all the deceit, without all the hurt. But we still have a job here to do while we're here. And that's to lead others into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and to encourage others and to use the spiritual gifts whatever it is that he's gifted us. And that's a whole nother message on spiritual gifts. I've done a really uh, cool study on that, that the Lord has given me some, some stuff on when I did a women's conference, but just recognizing he will return the way that he left. And if we are still here, we have not gone home before that we get to go with him. We will, we will, we will be, united in that home going. So even the people that we've disagreed with, if they had a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, they're going to. And so we're going to live with them for eternity. We better figure out how to kind of get along with them here. Um, the other thing is that we need to be united in prayer before we move out. So if you belong to a church and you are at odds with that church constantly. You need to maybe reevaluate, are you where God wants you to be? Or are you being rebellious? Are you sitting under maybe false teaching? I don't know. I'm not telling anybody to make any changes, but that's my point is that you either need to come alongside them or maybe get out the boat. So even in ministry or whatever it is, there's times where you recognize that God is pulling you out of somewhere or from someone. And that does happen. And it can be something or someone good and they're doing good works, but it's no longer where you're supposed to be. And so you have to recognize that and move on. So you need to be united in prayer before you move. That united in prayer may be with your your spouse. You you need to be united with them if you're especially if you're making big changes and, and serving the Lord and things like that. I know when I first started doing mission work, my husband did not want me to lead teams. And because he said, you know, I know how you are and you get committed to things and <coughs> excuse me, I'll never see you. And I was like, oh, no, no, just, you know, one a year. And then I ended up being like three a year. And so he was right. But I did not go until he heard from the Lord that I was supposed to be doing that. So I had to submit that to God because I had to trust that God was going to speak to my husband and work in his heart. Had I have tried to manipulate and change that, there would have been a lot of resentment from him. And I can tell you that he's been nothing but supportive times where I thought he would say no. And I almost wanted to use that as an excuse not to go. Uh, he said, Karen, if you feel that the Lord is calling you there, then I, then I fully support that. So those are some of the things that I have as a takeaway. And of course, when he told uh, the disciples to go to the nations, to preach the gospel and to make disciples, I am all about that. That's what this group is about. And uh, it is us really kind of iron sharpening iron. And I want to lead you to that more secure relationship. I want to have a more secure relationship and knowledge in Jesus Christ. So I am going to jump off of here. I didn't mean for this to be 20 minutes. I meant for it to be 10 minutes, but I do feel like what I, I wanted to tell you, I guess, took that long. So thank you for tuning in. I know some of you are going to be watching this later, and I appreciate you watching. If you have any questions or if you have any feedback, please, I do want to hear that. Feel free to post in the comments. Feel free to private message me if it's something you don't really want to discuss in person. I will be praying for you. I've been praying for this group. I'm excited to see what God is going to do and how he's going to make the changes within us, how he's going to use us right where we're at to propel us into the work that he is calling us to. So many blessings to you. I'm, I'm excited that you all have, have the same heart and the same mind in moving forward and learning more about our Savior. God bless you, and I'll talk to you soon.